Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering, and this is module four, Moments of a Random Variable. The first concept in this module is the, the notion of expected value. And expected value is simply the average of the random numbers represented by a random variable. We work with expected value averages a lot because um, basically they, they just give us sort of a, a very quick and dirty impression of what kind of values are being represented by a random variable. You know, a, a PDF, looking at the, the picture of a PDF or a histogram will give us the, the full picture of what we can expect from a, a particular random variable. So we get the most information from a PDF, but sometimes we just want to have a quick number to give us an idea of, you know, are these numbers large? Are they small? Are they positive? Are they negative? And that's really where sort of expected value and moments in general comes in. So it's important to note that there's always two different ways to calculate the, um, in this case, the, the mean or the expected value of a random variable. One is to just do it experimentally. If you have access to uh, the experimental data that the random variable is based on, you basically just take that whole string of random numbers and you pl plug it into Excel or MATLAB and you simply just add them up and divide by the total number of numbers. However, when you're working, when you don't have access to the experimental data, but you do have access to the PDF, there's a, a different way to determine uh, the mean of a random variable or the average of a random variable. And that's basically to take the first moment of the PDF. So as a bit of notation, whenever we take the average of a random variable, we, you know, I'll, I'll refer to it as either average or expected value. They, they mean the same thing. And the notation I'm going to use in this class is E to indicate expected value then curly brackets or braces, and then inside is whatever we're taking the average of. So the expected value, um, or the expected value is an operator, I guess. And in the case of just taking the expected value of a straight random variable by itself, um, how we, we calculate the average is we essentially take the first moment of the PDF. So we multiply the PDF by X, the variable of integration, and then we integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity. And so as a quick example, the average of a uniformly distributed random variable, uniformly distributed between A and B, is just X times the PDF. And um, just as a reminder, this is what the PDF looks like. So it's a constant equal to 1 over b minus a. And the integral goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, but because the PDF is 0 everywhere except between a and b, um, we integrate from a to b. We multiply the or, or and within this range of the value of the PDF is a constant, we multiply that constant by x. We perform the integration and then the mean is a plus b over 2. So basically the mean is the midpoint between um, a and b. And we would expect that. You know, if all numbers are, are equally likely between a and b, the mean or the average value should be the midpoint between those numbers. Or sorry, between the the um, the two limits of the of the distribution. Expected value can also be calculated for a discrete random variable. Now remember, a discrete random variable is um, a summation of shifted delta functions. Each delta function weighted by the probability that the corresponding um, discrete value xi occurs. And so we plug this formula into the same um, first moment equation. We multiply it by x and then we integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity. Now, if you have a, a delta function, centered at some value xi, 
and you multiply it by the variable of integration and you integrate over it, the result is just equal to xi uh, multiplied by the area of the, um, of, the, of the delta function. In this case, if it's a normal delta function, the area is just equal to 1. However, we weight our um, delta functions with the probability value pi. And so this integration then just turns into a simple summation where we multiply each um, possible outcome of the random variable with the probability that that outcome occurs. And as, a, as a, just a, a quick example of this, let's consider a fair six-sided dice where each um, possible outcome is equally likely to occur. The expected value equation then just becomes 1 multiplied by the probability 1 occurs plus 2 times the probability 2 occurs plus 3 times the probability that 3 occurs and so on. And you could say, well, this is just a, a simple average and that's true. However, if, these pro if it was not a fair six-sided dice, then these probabilities would be different and the numbers that were more likely to occur would be multiplied by higher probabilities and they would get more weight in the expected value calculation. And so um, anyways, for this fair six-sided dice example, the expected value is equal to 3.5. Now, it's important to note that 3.5 cannot occur um, when you're rolling a six-sided dice, right? Because you only ever get integer values. And so the average or the expected value doesn't necessarily have to represent an actual outcome from the random variable, which is important to remember because sometimes people think of the, the average as the most likely um, number to occur or to be represented by the random variable. And that's made even worse by the fact that we call it the expected value, which means it's the value that we expect. Um, but in this case, obviously, um, it's, a, it's a fractional number, so, so that number can't actually um, occur. So uh, a few more properties of the expected value operation. It's linear. That means um, if x and y are two independent random variables, if we take the average of the summation of x and y, it's the same thing as taking the average of x and adding it to the average of y. If we scale the random numbers um, represented by x by a constant c, it's the same thing as calculating the expected value of, of x and then multiplying that expected value by that constant c. Something that engineers commonly do are, is to deal with systems that have random inputs. And so if you have a, a deterministic system, that means a, a system that doesn't have any random components itself, if you have a deterministic system and you give it a random input, you generally also get a random output, but that random output is transformed um, by whatever the operation of the system uh, performs, you know, if it's rectifying a signal or, or whatever. And so often we can represent our, our system as a function, g. And so in this case, g would be our system, x would be our input, and y would be our random output that's been altered or changed. So the PDF, for example, of y is different than the PDF of x after, or because x has passed through the, the system g. And later on in the course, we'll figure out how to actually determine um, that PDF. But sometimes you don't want to know the full PDF. Let's say maybe you just want to figure out the expected value of the signal at the output of the system. Or um, more commonly, let's say you want to determine the variance, which is equivalent to the, the power um, of the random signal at the output of the system. You don't actually have to determine the PDF in that case. You can just modify the expected value formula. So Let's say that y is the output of a, a function g that has an input x. The expected value of y can be calculated using the PDF of x. Sorry, there should be an x there. The expected value of y is just the integral of the PDF of x multiplied by the function with the variable of integration as an argument. And so um, just as an example, let's determine the mean of the output of a system, y, that squares the 
a random signal x, and x is uniformly distributed between 0 and 2. So that means that y is just equal to the square of, of x. So to determine the expected value of y, we integrate um, from 0 to 2. So this integral is performed over the range of the, the input variable x. We then multiply by the function. In this case, the function is just the squaring operation. So we have x squared. This should be a little x, x squared. And then we multiply by the PDF. In this case, the, the PDF is just a constant value equal to 1 half, um, defined between the limits 0 to 2. So we perform this integration, and the result is 4 thirds. So the expected value of y is 4 thirds. And we can see that um, the system, the squaring operation, has changed the statistical nature of the signal at the output. Because at the input, we know from the previous slide that the mean of a uniformly distributed random variable um, distributed between 0 and 2 is just the midpoint of that distribution, which is just equal to 1. The squaring operation has actually increased the expected value. Um, and it's because basically the squaring operation sort of increases the weight of larger values in a nonlinear way. This notion can be extended to much more complicated problems. So um, later on in some of our practice problems, we'll see that the probability of bit error can be expressed in terms of, or the probability of bit error in a communication system can be expressed in terms of, of the Q function. And we will define a metric called signal to noise ratio where um, SNR, signal to noise ratio, is just the the square of the desired signal divided by the variance of the noise um, corrupting that signal. And this is the function that defines um, the probability of bit error. But in a wireless situation, the desired signal amplitude actually is also randomly changing due to fading in the channel. And so if we want to determine the average probability of bit error by taking and, and take fading into account, we can multiply it by the PDF of the fading. This PDF is often the Rayleigh distribution or the Ricean distribution. And then we integrate and we get the average probability of bit error for a system in a, uh, in a wireless channel. And so, um, you know, I won't go into it in any more detail than that, but hopefully you can see how this fairly simple idea can sort of be extended into um, to, to help us model much more complicated systems. Expected value is just the first, what we, what we call the first order moment, and there are um, what we refer to as higher order moments as well. So the nth order moment of a random variable is just the expected value of that random variable raised to the nth exponent. And we know from talking about the function of a random variable stuff on the previous slide that raising a random variable to an exponent can just be considered passing it through a function and we determine the expected value of the random variable in that case still using the PDF of our original random variable x but then multiplying it by um, the function. In this case it's the variable of integration raised to the exponent of n. A really common or probably the most common higher order moment that we care about is the the second order moment with which is just the expected value of x squared. The reason for that particularly for engineers is because this moment is typically used to represent the power of a random signal. So we know that power is equal to v squared over r where v is the voltage or the amplitude of our signal. Often we assume, just for convenience, a resistance equal to 1 ohm, so we don't normally use the add in the resistance, although we certainly can. Um, and then we typically then just think of the second order moment as being equivalent or, or equal to the power of a, uh, of a random variable. And so it's, a, it's a, a something that we, we calculate all the time. In this particular 
example, um, I'm calculating the second order moment of the uniformly distributed random variable, uniformly distributed between a and b. Here we have x squared. The PDF is just equal to a constant. Um, then we integrate from a to b, x squared. We perform the integration, and then we get this um, equation as our result. The next thing I'd like to talk about is variance um, and higher order moments. And um, variance is a term that I've used a, a couple of times, in, in particular in the context of the Gaussian random variable, because variance is actually an argument for the PDF equation. And we said that, um, you know, variance basically quantifies how much the random variable is spread out around the mean. And now we're at the point where we can formally define exactly what variance is. So we call variance a, a non-central moment. That's because we um, subtract the mean off of the random variable x before we square it. And what I'm going to do here is there's a, a couple different ways that you can calculate variance. And I've got one method sort of written out in, in a fairly large number of steps because I want to illustrate um, some of the properties of the expected value operator and how it can be used in a derivation. And so in this equation, we have two quantities. We've got the random variable x, and then we've got the value mu, which is the mean or the expected value of that random variable. And so in the next step in the equation, all I've done is I've expanded out the squaring operation. And you'll notice that we've got three terms. But we know that the expected value operator is a linear operator. And so rather than adding all these things up and then taking the expected value, we can um, take the expected value of each term separately. So we can take the expected value of x squared, the expected value of minus 2 mu x, and the expected value of mu squared. Now, we can go a little bit further and again take advantage of the linearity property of the expected value operator. We know that minus 2 mu is a constant, so we can just bring it outside of the random variable and put it out front, or sorry, outside of the expected value operator and put it out front. We also know that mu squared is a constant. So even though the random variable is random, its moments are not. So the average of a random variable, the expected value of a random variable is constant. It is not random. And so the expected value of a constant is just equal to the constant. So for, for the purposes of this third term, we can just get rid of the expected value operator. Now, we know that mu is just equal to the expected value of x. And so I can write it like that for the, the third term. We have mu times the expected value of x in the second term. So this is also just equal to the expected value of x squared. Um, and then we've got plus the expected value of x squared minus two times the expected value of x squared. And so then the final form of the equation is just this. And so if we want to determine the variance of a random variable, we figure out its mean, we figure out its second order moment, and then we just subtract the square of the mean from the, from the second order moment. A second way to calculate variance is to consider the function of a random variable approach. And we can um, assume that we've got a random variable z, I'm sorry, these should be capitals, which is a function of the random variable x. And that function is equal to um, the operator where we subtract off the mean and square it. And so we can calculate the variance of x directly by taking the PDF of x, integrating from minus infinity to infinity, and multiplying by the function g of x. Although this second method is usually harder 
then just figuring out the um, the mean of the random variable and the second order um, moment and then just uh, subtracting one from the other. Finally, we know from other work in uh, electrical engineering, um, signal processing, uh, control systems, that transforms are often useful. So we think of the Fourier transform, we think of the Laplace transform, and it turns out there is kind of a, a transform-like operation when dealing with the moments of a random variable. So a moment generating function is, you know, essentially it looks kind of like the, the Laplace or the Fourier transform of the PDF. And if we, so S is uh, um, the argument for this, what we call the moment generating function, and X is the variable of integration. But this, if we think of it as a function of x, this is just the, the moment of this transform equation looks like taking the moment of a random variable after passing it through a, a function. So we can express this as the expected value of the um, random variable x raised to the exponent of, or sorry, in the exponent of e multiplied by s in the exponent of, of e, which is the function g of x. And so how moments are calculated with the moment generating function is by taking the derivative of the moment generating function and then setting the variable s to zero. And to show how that works, if we take the derivative of the moment generating function with respect to s, we can take the derivative of the integral equation and note that this derivative does not make the integral disappear because we're in we're taking the derivative with respect to s and the integral is being taken with respect to x so all we're doing is we're taking the derivative of e to the sx which is just e to the sx multiplied by x but then uh, and then if we think of this again as a function of a random variable g of x, this equation can be expressed as the expected value of the random variable x multiplied by e to the sx because this extra x term was created by the derivative. However, if we set s equal to zero, this term goes to one and we're left with the expected value of x. So basically the way, um, the way this works is we take the derivative um, once, twice, three times to calculate the first, second, or third order moment of the random variable. We take the derivative um, n times to get the expected value of x, x to the n multiplied by e to the sx. And then if we set s equal to zero, we get something equivalent to um, the expected value of x raised to the n. Why is this um, interesting or important? It's basically because taking the derivative is generally easier than solving an integral. So similar to Laplace and Fourier transforms, often moment generating functions are, are given to us in a table. Uh, for this example, we're going to use the moment generating function for the Gaussian random variable, which is given by um, this expression here. and um, just to sort of illustrate how this works, the mean of the um, of the moment generating function is, or the, the first order moment is calculated by taking the single derivative uh, of the moment generating function and setting s equal to zero. So the first derivative is given by this, setting s equal to zero, um, remove sets the exponent term to one sets this to zero and we then end up just getting mu. The mean squared value, the second order moment, and this should be the second derivative, is by taking the derivative of the moment generating function twice, which gives us this expression 
and then if you set s equal to zero, some terms go to one, some terms go to zero, and we're equal to the mu squared plus the variance. And this, again, should make sense because the expected value or the second order moment of the um, Gaussian random variable or any random variable should be equal to the squared mean plus the variance because variance is equal to the second order moment of any random variable minus the mean squared. Okay, so not only are moment generating functions good for determining the means of random variables, they're also good for determining in some cases um, the mean of a function of a random variable. In particular, uh, when that function is uh, an exponential function or has an exponential form. So the classic example, or one of the classic examples of this for the uh, case of electrical engineering is to determining the average probability of bit error for a wireless communication system. And so let's consider a, uh, a simple binary communication system where we transmit uh, plus or minus one to represent one and zero through a channel with an attenuation of a. So that basically means that when we, when our plus or minus one goes through, through the channel, it gets multiplied by a factor a, where a is less than one uh, and greater than zero. And once we've attenuated our signal, we add a random variable w to it. And w is meant to represent the thermal noise present in the electronics. And that is um, normally distributed with a uh, zero mean and a variance sigma squared. And so um, on the assignment, what I'm going to ask you to do is consider a, a binary communication system just like this, except where the channel attenuation at A is constant. And um, so it would be for the non-wireless case, or for example, a wired channel. and uh, what you'll find on the assignment is that the probability of error for the scenario where a is constant is equal to the q function with an argument of a divided by sigma. Now, because q, the q function doesn't have a closed form, we will often, or it's, it's quite common to work with approximations of the q function, um, in particular upper bounds and sometimes lower bounds. And one very popular upper bound for the Q function is to approximate it using one half multiplying multiplied by the exponential function, where instead of, where the argument for the exponential function instead of being a divided by sigma is minus a squared divided by two sigma squared. And this isn't a particularly tight upper bound, but it is popular because it does using a simple exponential function does really simplify our math. And so the next thing we need to do is define uh, receive signal to noise ratio. And signal to noise ratio G is equal to the receive signal power, which is A squared. So we're assuming that our receive signal level is plus or minus A after the channel attenuation. And if it's a voltage signal, then we just square it to get the power. And then we divide that by our noise power sigma squared because the random variable w with variance sigma squared is meant to represent our additive noise. Now, in the wireless channel, the channel attenuation is going to change due to um, the constructive and destructive interference of reflections off of objects in the environment. And the environment, you know, we assume that these objects in the environment are moving. And we then model this change in our channel attenuation by representing our received signal to noise ratio as a random variable with some PDF given by this expression here. And so typically what wireless engineers want to do is um, not to always determine the, um, the bit error rate for sort of the best channel attenuation or the worst channel attenuation. Instead, typically they want to know the bit error rate averaged over all possible variations in our received signal to noise ratio. And to do that, we determine or we use basically the, the formula that we talked about earlier, which is um, the formula that determines the mean 
of a function of a random variable, and specifically the formula that determines the expected value of some function g, where the argument g is a random variable x, and we saw that this is equal to the integral of g of x multiplied by the PDF for x dx. And so when we want to determine the average probability of error, we basically just um, use this function, or we use the mean of a random variable function, which is what I just circled here, where um, the one-half uh, exponential function to the minus one-half g is basically our function g of x, and our PDF f of x is just the PDF of our random signal-to-noise ratio variation. Now, the reason why this writing this equation is important is because if you compare the form of this function that I just circled to the formula for determining the moment generating function phi, you'll find that it has exactly the same form. And so if we want to determine the average probability of error, we don't even have to perform this integral. We can just basically take um, the moment generating function directly, multiply it by one half because we have the one half out here, and we give it an argument of minus one half, and that's meant to represent that one half there. And so just go back a few slides, take a look at the formula for the moment generating function, um, convince yourself that it's basically the same as the formula for random uh, probability of error, and then you'll see how um, the moment generating function saves us from solving this integral. So as long as we have the moment generating function for the PDF of g, then we get the, the probability of error directly. And, and this is really handy because depending on sort of the physical conditions of the, the wireless environment, we may want to assume different distributions for um, the random variation of g. So let's consider a very common um, distribution for g, and that's the, uh, the distribution for the Rayleigh channel. So a Rayleigh channel is kind of a worst case wireless channel, and when you look at the distribution for the received signal to noise ratio in a Rayleigh channel, you'll find that it has um, an exponential form. So the PDF is given by, oops, the PDF is given by this, where the factor lambda is just equal to one over the average received signal to noise ratio. Uh, the moment generating function for an exponentially distributed random variable is um, relatively simple. It's just the same factor lambda divided by lambda minus s. And so if you multiply um, this by one half, and then you substitute minus one half into the um, value for s, and then you just express it in terms of the average signal to noise ratio, you get this um, relatively straightforward expression. And so we can plot the average probability of bit error due to, uh, or versus um, this average receive signal to noise ratio function. And uh, this is what we get. So on the y-axis, we've got probability of bit error in a log scale. On the x-axis, we've got signal to noise ratio expressed as dB. And this signal to noise ratio, again, is just the, the average received signal to noise ratio. So that's that um, uh, expected value of g term. And I'm showing two curves here. This first curve is a, um, a more exact expression for uh, average bit error rate in a Rayleigh channel, and this solid curve is the function that we just derived using the moment generating function. So it's higher than the exact solution because we used an upper bound for the, for the Q function basically, so it's less accurate, but it was um, quite a bit simpler to uh, calculate. And you know, obviously, if we've got a more exact expression for this particular case, we would use it. So most people would use the dotted uh, line expression. But the moment generating function, or the moment generating um, technique, or the technique of using the moment generating functions, becomes a lot more uh, powerful when you consider more elaborate um, 
wireless communication systems. So different types of modulation, multiple receive antennas, and uh, things like that.